Why don't we get started? Um, this, this lecture is going to be recorded and be available um, online if people, you know, people who couldn't make the talk, um, they'll be able to watch it or you can re-watch it at a later time and the link will be sent out. So I, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Harold and Marilyn Menke's Memorial Lecture. The lectureship was established in 1989 to recognize and honor the Menke's um, involvement in and devotion to pulmonary research and teaching. And its purpose is to bring to the university and the School of Public Health the leading pulmonary scientists to take part in formal and informal educational activities. And this year we're delighted that Michelle Bell has agreed to, to come. Dr. Bell received her PhD in the Bloomberg School in what was then Department of Environmental Health Sciences in 2002. She's actually the first speaker at this um, lectureship who act, got her degree at Johns Hopkins. She moved quickly, was recruited quickly in 2004 to Yale as assistant professor and rapidly moved up the ranks. Um, and she was promoted to professor um, seven years later in 2011. And in 2015, she was given a named lectureship, the Mary E. Pinchow Professor. And Dr. Bell's an internationally recognized and widely sought after expert on the environmental impacts on human health, particularly related to air pollution and climate change. Her research has been involved with studying the health of impact of airborne exposure to particulate matter arising from multiple sources, including cigarette smoke, urban air, and wildfire smoke. And su such exposures can affect the elderly, pregnant mothers, as well as the general population. And, and Michelle has been analyzing the effect in, in, in these, each of these groups. In addition, she's also examined how secondary environmental factors such as economic status, ambient temperature, or pollutant gases such as ozone interact with the effects of particulate matter. With 150 peer-reviewed publications, um, membership on numerous grant review and advisory panels, as well as being mentor for many pre- and postdoctoral trainees, Michelle's work and ideas have had a significant impact and will continue to have a significant influence on our understanding of how environmental impacts affect lung health and general disease of uh, human populations. And today she's going to give us some of these current insights in her talk entitled, you can see on the board, Air Pollution and Human Health Challenges and Paths Forward. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Michelle Bell. All right, thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. It's always a joy to come back home to Baltimore and to Johns Hopkins. Um, and thank all of you for coming. I'm so excited to be here today and to share my work with you. Um, so um, today, rather than give a kind of traditional talk of you know, one research project front to end, what I thought I would do for this special lecture is to talk about air pollution research and to think about some of the challenges this research field faces, including some of the, the challenges I face in my own research and, and what we're doing to address them in the field more broadly. Um, but I'm also very interested in environmental history, and I'm particularly interested in how, how we got to study air pollution in general with relation to environmental health. So how many people are familiar with the London Fog of 1952 episode? Most people? Okay. So this is my favorite picture from the London Fog of 1952. For those of you who are not familiar, this is a picture taken at 1030 in the morning where you can see a police officer through air pollution. It looks like it's nighttime, but he's really showing the way through low visibility. Uh, this is another picture from nighttime. Uh, looks and so I'm just going to show you a short video while I describe it. Um, so we've known that air pollution impacts health for a very long time, even before London 1952. But it's really this episode, and this is some video from the actual event, where you can see um, this low visibility, which is actually from air pollution, where people couldn't see their hand in front of their face. And you had such extreme levels of air pollution and extreme health events that this became obvious to the general public, to the scientific community, and to decision makers. And this may seem a little bit like a historical exercise that I'm bringing to you today, but it's really not as we have growing air pollution problems in many parts of the world that have expanding transportation and expanding urbanization, 
often with unplanned growth in places like India and China, where we have levels of air pollution reaching levels of the London 1952. And in fact, you may have seen a lot of areas that have smog masks. Well, smog masks were big in London. This is an advertisement not from the London 1952 episode, but from around that time period where you could wear smog masks and still be fashionable in the 1950s. <clears throat> and we had many such high air pollution episodes. <clears throat> I'm gonna have to forgive my voice today. But we still have high air pollution episodes today. These are some photographs today showing very high air pollution levels from different parts of the world, from China, France, and India. And we even still have these air pollution masks that have even become part of fashion. My favorite is how it's become part of fashion shows in Asia. So where have we come with air pollution where we've known that air pollution is harmful to human health since the 1950s when we started studying it, but now we have actually growing air pollution problems in many parts of the world and we still have air pollution masks as part of our culture and a growing part of our culture in many worlds. Oh, and you can even buy air pollution masks for your pets. So these are some of the key research themes that I see in this area of work. Where we started with looking at effects of a single pollutant, looking at effects in the present day, looking at effects of the general population or some subpopulations, and looking at effects in the US or Western-based populations. I'm gonna talk through a little bit of each of these and then tell you a little bit about where we're moving to the future. So let's start with effects of a single pollutant. So this is a picture that many of you may know from a very famous study, often called the Harvard Six City Study, led by Douglas Dockery, who's still at Harvard. I want to draw your attention to this photo here, where what you're looking at, I think I can't walk around. Maybe if I use one of these. Is this on? All right. I'm going to go rock star style and use this. All right, so if you look at this photo, you can see on the bottom here we have air pollution levels, and on the y-axis we have a risk rate. And what this is looking at are six different cities going from Portage, Wisconsin, with the P, to the S of Steubenville, Ohio. What Harvard did was set up air pollution monitors because they didn't exist at that time for PM 2.5. And in the upper right-hand side, I think I have a more blown-up photo coming next, you can see that it's, it's almost a straight line, which is pretty amazing for an epidemiological study, showing that your risk of mor mortality, and this is for a cohort study, they're adjusting for things like smoking and BMI, showing higher and higher risk as you have higher and higher levels of fine particles. This study and many others, but largely this study, were instrumental in setting the standard and the need for a standards for fine particles in the United States, and we now have national monitoring networks for PM2.5, and also launching interest in looking at smaller sized particles. Now we even look at smaller particles. It also had some other kind of interesting side effects in that Steubenville got tired of being reported as the most polluted city. So it's actually not the most polluted city anymore when you look at these six studies. But as you'll notice, they're looking at a single pollutant. And now we have a wealth of literature since that time from me and many, many, many other people. These are just some examples. And I've circled for you in the titles where they're looking at a single pollutant, at coarse particles or ozone. And these are all really good studies. But you know, why do we look at a single pollutant? Well, it's easier to look at a single pollutant first. And this is really important. And it doesn't mean that scientists are ignorant to the fact that other pollutants are around. It's just that these other pollutants are often considered as confounders because this is a reasonable place to start to look at for where we're going to look at our science. And it also is how our regulatory structure. So we have increasing evidence for air pollution and single pollutants. But this is how air pollution is regulated worldwide. Now I'm showing you the United States for relevance because that's where we are. But you'll notice the pollutants are each regulated separately. These are the National Ambient Air Quality Standards for the United States. What that means is whether or not you're in compliance for ozone is based on your level of ozone. It doesn't matter what your level of SO2 is. And if you look at cities that have so-called multi-pollutant structures, what they're really looking at is ways of trying to, in a multi-pollutant framework, achieve these single pollutant standards. 
because we do not have the multi-pollutant science to back it up. But that's not the real world, right? And so what we're trying to do is, in, in the public health field, looking at real world relevance, is move our science to what's gonna best improve society and best improve public health. So we're starting from these early studies, like the London fog, where you looked at overall pollution. It was a high pollution day or a low pollution day. So these single pollutant studies to now looking at pollutant mixtures. From a scientific perspective, we want to know how the body responds. And this makes a lot of sense because your body's not just looking at a single pollutant. It's looking at a mixture of pollutants as you're breathing all these different things at once. From a policy perspective, this is extremely powerful because imagine if we could tell you that this mixture of pollutants was more harmful than that mixture of pollutants we could make more effective regulation. <clears throat> and this brings me to the issue of particulate matter. You may have noticed, and I'll go back. All right, I have to be over here to do this. I'm not that coordinated. You may have noticed when we look at these pollutants here, that at the bottom here, we're looking at particles. But all the other pollutants, if you think of carbon monoxide or um, Ozone is O3, but basically the name of an air pollutant is its chemical structure, with maybe the exception of ozone, which is O3. But particles are the only pollutant worldwide regulated without regard to chemical form. They can be made up of any different chemical mixture. And that chemical mixture can vary very broadly. So that in itself is a complex chemical mixture. And it's been linked with numerous health effects. We know particles are very harmful. We've known that for a long time, even before the Harvard Six City study. Those are just some of the different health effects that they're linked to. But which particles are most harmful? Well, this is some work that we did quite some time ago, but I wanted to show you that when I talk about the chemical structure of particles being different, these are not little differences. The chemical structure of particles can vary dramatically. This is showing you the seasonal sulfate PM2.5 averages for 187 US counties. Now, if any atmospheric chemists are in the room, you know there's no such thing as sulfate. It's really ammonium sulfate, but this is how EPA measures it. Just bringing this up as one of the research challenges is we're often stuck with the monitoring networks that we have. But let's just see a few things from this figure. One is that just each dot is a, a county, and red dots are higher concentrations than, than blue dots. So if you look at the lower left on summer, you see much higher concentrations on the east coast than the west coast. That's from coal-fired power plants and the predominant wind patterns. So we have very strong spatial patterns. And if I looked at the fraction of particles that are sulfate or ammonium sulfate, this map would look very similar. The other thing you see is that this pattern, while it remains throughout the year, it differs by season. So I have temporal patterns as well. This is all regulated the same. There'd be other differences if I looked at nitrate or ammonium nitrate, it'd be higher on the western coast due to transportation. It's different around different parts of the world. So the, our, we have a study that shows that the PM2.5 in Seoul is most, more similar to the western US because it deals with transportation rather than coal-fired power plants. So that means if you have a study that shows the health effects of PM2.5 across the year, you're comparing a different chemical composition at different times of the year. Um, and Roger Peng actually has some really nice studies looking at this. Um, if you look at PM2.5 at different locations, you're looking at different um, issues as well. So this is a really important issue. Which of these is most harmful? So just to give you an example of some of the work that's been done on this, um, we did a study with 12.5, not 12.5 enrollees, 12.5 million <laughs> Medicare enrollees 65 years and older in the eastern U.S. And we tried to identify which constituents contribute to mortality and also which constituents spatially and temporally can vary, co vary with PM2.5 and mortality, controlling with community level confounders. So here are a few things to show you. One is that we have higher levels of um, mortality for the particles that have higher levels of silicon. That's a lot of dust, a lot of agriculture, a lot of biomass burning. Um, sodium as well showing up. Sulfate not showing up. 
And some of you may be thinking, well, she was talking about mixtures, and now she's breaking it down into chemical components. So I mentioned I would highlight the challenges. So this is a little bit of a behind the scenes look at some of the things that happen. One of the challenges we have is a dimensionality problem. We have 50 plus different chemical constituents that are measured by EPA. We and others decided to kind of start with a select number of chemical components to see if they could help us start with what chemical structures to look at. Each of these are related to different sources. Elemental carbon relates a lot to traffic. We could look at nickel and vanadium that looks a lot to oil combustion and so on. So these are some of the starting paths we're using to try to look at chemical constituents. <coughs> Another study that we're working on, which also involves Roger Peng here at the school, is looking at temple trend of PM 2.5. So, you know, the particles we have now change over time, not just throughout season, but also across years. The sources of particles and the different vehicles that we have are different now than they were five, ten years ago. On the way, way walking to this seminar, I was talking to someone who drives a Prius Prime. That didn't exist 10 years ago, right? So are particles today more or less harmful than particles 10 years ago? This is something that's not being accounted for in the regulation at all. So in this work, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna walk you through this model. We have county level associations where we have the expected um, risk for a given county, um, taking into account the population at risk, the PM 2.5 level on a given lag, and we can estimate that nonlinearly, day of the week, nonlinear functions for temperature, previous temperature, dew point, previous temperature, um, nonlinear functions for time, taking into account age group, uh, nonlinear functions for age group and time, and so on. And then combine those to get an overall effect. And just to show you some results that are preliminary, <coughs> Well, I, I get my cough drop. Um, and this is work done partly by my uh, doctoral student, Chen Chen, who is fantastic. Um, this work looks at cardiovascular and respiratory hospital missions for the Medicare population. And this is showing you the PM 2.5 health risk over time. So one of the things we see is that even though PM 2.5 chemical structure is changing over time, the health risk for cardiovascular risk of hospital emissions is not really changing that much over time, but for respiratory hospitalizations, it is. So what does that mean? Our, our regulatory estimates tend to be based on studies that were conducted around here. Something is happening over here. We're not exactly sure for what. Is this increase real? Is it some artifact? Well, this is really important for us to find out. So the next step that um, Chen is doing is to look at a larger set of data where we can include more cities, including some more rural and suburban areas in addition to these areas that are more urban, right? And just one more thing I wanna share with you. This is for my postdoc, Sulky Ho. Um, this is looking at the differences between the change in PM10 related risk of hospital emissions um, attributable to an IQR increase in NDVI. So NDVI is related to greenness. So this is showing that areas that have more green space have a lower association between PM10 and cardiovascular disease. So why would your risk of PM10 and cardiovascular hospital emissions be lower if you lived near green space? There are a lot of possible reasons. One is that maybe you get out and exercise more, uh, one is that green space, some trees remove air pollutants. Well, that should just change the level of PM10. But depending on how it's removing air pollution, it could change the chemical structure of air pollution. So that's something that Sulky's working on, and she's actually meeting with foresters to try to work on that. So there's a lot of challenges here, and you can see why an interdisciplinary focus is really needed to start to look on solutions to these problems. For the work that I've showed you, we've interacted with atmospheric chemists, starting to interact with foresters and other types of people beyond just epidemiology and biostatistics to really get at these solutions of how we're going to look at chemical mixtures. But the key theme, moving from looking at the effects of a single pollutant to looking at multiple pollutants, mixtures, and sources. The next, which is probably one you could predict, is looking at from effects today to looking at effects in the future. <coughs> 
This is a map that I pulled just uh, off of some data I pulled off of PubMed, where I looked at studies that looked at climate change and health in the title. Um, and you can see back when I was at Hopkins, which is not that long ago, um, there weren't that many studies on it, and now there's this huge increase in climate change and health articles. Uh, what you can't see from this is what those studies are saying, but based on many review articles, these studies are overwhelmingly saying that climate change is anticipated to have increased in harm for public health. So we have enormous growing scientific evidence that climate change is gonna harm human health. And air pollution is one of the many ways that climate change is anticipated to have a pathway to impact human health. I'm not gonna go through all of this, but this is from a project where we looked at wildfires and human health. And I just wanna point out a few things. One of the things we did is um, look at using GOS chem modeling to estimate gridded forest fire estimates of PM 2.5. The challenge I wanna focus on here is how do you estimate uh, wildfire smoke? You can't just go measure it. There is no monitor in the world that will tell you the source of what that pollutant is from. So there are different methods. We um, worked with air quality modelers to model what are the wildfires from smoke uh, from wildfires. And this is an, was an interdisciplinary uh, connection that we had to make. And I'll give you another example of some of the challenges of this interdisciplinary work. <clears throat> we ask a lot about model validation. Like, you know, how well is your model validated? And they're like, we have all this validation. We're so good at predicting where wildfires are. We don't really need to know where the wildfires are. We need to know where the smoke is. So if your model is perfect at predicting wildfires, it may be good or bad at predicting where the smoke is. For the purpose of our study, we only need to know where the smoke is. You could actually get the wildfire wrong. I mean, you probably wouldn't get the smoke right if you got the wildfire wrong. But we actually only really need to know where the smoke is. So you need to validate the model for our purpose. We're using it for wildfire smoke. Then we're estimating the association between wildfire smoke and health in the present day. My personal scientific belief is that we have to understand these systems in the present day before we understand them for the future. And then we estimate them for the future. Why is this important? Well, this is before some of the crazy wildfires we've had in the past couple of years, but I noticed in looking at economic estimates of wildfires, and I looked at many, none of them included human health, not one. There may be some that include human health, but I didn't find them. That means like nobody coughed, <coughs> which I'm doing right now, but. <coughs> you know, we all know that human health is an enormous economic burden. Um, then there were some studies that included um, issues with wildfire fight firefighters, but not population health. So in my mind, that meant that these damages of like 7 billion, 58 million, were enormous underestimates, all right? So that's why we decided to do this study on wildfires, all right? So first we did a study looking at wildfires and human health in the present day. Um, and one of the things we came up with was this idea of a smoke wave. Your exposure to wildfire smoke is very different from your exposure to other types of air pollution. And you could think of it as you move across time, your exposure to traffic pollution kind of goes up and down. But exposure to wildfire smoke is like nothing, nothing, and then really, really high, and then nothing. So you could think of it like a, a heat wave. And this is work from my uh, former student, Coco Liu, who also did a, a postdoc here in Biostats at Johns Hopkins. And one of the great things that came out of her dissertation were these beautiful maps that we made online and interactive, so you could click on a county and look up all sorts of great information. Um, and so this is showing the difference in the number of smoke waves. Think of it like a heat wave, so we could define it in different ways to make it you know, stringent definition or less stringent. And this is the number of, difference in number of smoke waves <coughs> over six years from the present day to the future under a changing climate. And this is a middle of the road climate change scenario. Um, and so some of the interesting things you see 
are that there's some areas, kind of like in the upper Midwest, that are expected to have a lot more smoke waves, and then other areas, like in green, that are expected to have fewer smoke waves. Right? But there's more than that that's important. How long are those smoke waves going to last? Maybe you have fewer smoke waves, but they're all going to last really a really long time period. And so we also looked at how long the smoke waves were going to last. And we also looked at how intense those smoke waves are going to be. So how high is that PM 2.5 from wildfire smoke going to be? And so we made these um, interactive maps. And this was another lesson, lesson in a, kind of a naive on my part. But you know, we had our group looking at how to make these interactive maps. And then instead, we just hired an undergrad in computer science who did it in one weekend. <laughs> who I then offered to hire for the group, and he was like, I have a job at Google. Um, <laughs> true story. So, but um, he was able to very quickly, and frankly, very cheaply, for our part, make these really great maps online so a decision maker could click and find out information about smoke waves under different scenarios for their county. So we're looking at wildfires in the future. So we first identified that there was a, a problem, that this was not being studied for population health, looked at wildfires and health in the present day, dealt with the challenge of estimating that exposure, and then looked at it under a changing climate. And then with this additional issue of the maps, dealt with how do we disseminate that information to a broader audience than just us? Because a lot of people are interested in this information, but they're not gonna get it from a scientific journal and they really, a lot of people are interested in localized information that they may not get um, if they just look, you know, across a whole map. So a lot of people want to, you know, pinpoint their individual area. And for this particular study, we felt it was useful to share that information. <coughs> the next trend, which relates to a lot of work happening here at Hopkins, is that historically for air pollution, we've looked at the general population or some subpopulations, but we know that a lot of people have higher health effect estimates from the burden of air pollution than others. These are just some examples of some of the studies <coughs> that I've done and others have done studies as well, showing that groups, um, communities, individuals with unemployment have higher ozone mortality. Um, those with low education have higher temperature mortality. It's not air pollution. I threw some temperature in here. Um, um, African Americans had higher risk of ozone on mortality. And mothers of African American infants who are already at higher risk of having low birth weight infants had higher risk of having low birth weight infants from PM 2.5 exposure. But there are other, I think, less studied issues here. This is an issue looking at differences in PM 2.5 and hospital emissions by sex. I just want to point out, whoops, I thought I had a circle here, that um, I had a hard time getting funding for this study and never did get funding on the grounds that um, reviewers said that there was no difference between men and women. So eventually I just did it, like years later. But I'm like, our respiratory systems are different. Why would they be the same? <coughs> And I want to point out that it turns out there are some differences, and it differs, differs by cause, which makes sense. So for some, um, there are like peripheral vascular disease, which I'll point out is about, I know this laser pointer is not great, but like third from the bottom, there's no big differences. Black is everyone, blue is men, and pink are females. These are hospital missions for the Medicare population for major cities in the United States. And then for others, like heart rhythm disturbance, where most studies are reporting this, this um, black number, the overall, you'll see that effect is really just happening in women. So the effect is actually higher. Now these, these men and women, you can see it's like barely statistically different, but that's a big difference, you know? Now this is an epi study. So this epi study is not going to get a causal mechanism of like what's happening in heart rhythm disturbance. We need other fields and other people, uh, some of whom may be in this room to help look at that. But this issue of men versus women for air pollution and other aspects of environmental health is a key issue I think we need to look at for different populations having different effects. Another thing to look at is that in a lot of discussions of environmental justice um, in my field, I see us still talking about differences in what is basically epidemiology, the beta. Um, you know, they have a different response 
This gr group A has a different response to the same hypothetical level of air pollution or environmental exposure than group B. But we don't all have the same level of exposure. And that's really important to mention as well because that's the real world conditions. I want to just kind of tie this back to the issue of air pollution mixtures. This is some work looking at PM2.5, and this is for the United States. <clears throat> In this particular example, we're showing the increase compared to non-Hispanic whites. For African Americans, you can see they have almost 10% almost higher um, exposure to PM2.5. But when we start looking at chemical components, that gradient of exposure is much higher. So it can be as much as, you know, 90% higher for Hispanics compared to non-Hispanic whites. So as we learn more about which of these components is most harmful, or mixture of these components is most, harm most harmful, we need to go back to this type of information and see who has the highest level of exposures. So it's not just the pollutant mixture, and it's not just those betas of who has the highest level of, of effect, but we also, also have different levels of exposure as well. And then there's um, this issue of urban versus rural. I still find in my field um, that, including my own studies, we tend to study mostly urban areas. It's because that's where the data is. And everyone in Epi has seen that famous cartoon of looking under the lamppost, right? I'm guilty of this as well. Uh, but this is some work from my former student, Mercedes Bravo, where she looked at the relationship between risk of cardiovascular and respiratory hospital emissions in relation to same-day PM2.5, and looked at this in relation to urbanicity. Um, it's one of the very few studies to do this, actually, so I'm actually very proud of, of, of her work. Um, so for cardiovascular disease, you can see, I, I won't bother to just describe the well, you can just look at the blue up here. So as you move more urban as you move to the right of each side panel. So as we move to the right, you can see there's you know, not a statistical trend, but there's a trend of it getting more harmful as you move to the right. Slightly more harmful, PM appears to be slightly more harmful as you move to the right and get more urban. Now we have a lot more urban, a lot more sample size up here. And what's different here, well, the chemical structure of particles is different. The people are different. Lots of things are different. We're accounting for things like age difference and so on, even though this is an older population. And then for rural populations, the most harmful effect shows up in the most rural population. And then we have this, you know, maybe a little bit of the same trend happening over here. So what's different here? These are our big agricultural communities where you see a big respiratory jump. So I think this urban-rural difference is something that's missing from the environmental disparities discussion in addition to very important issues of race, ethnicity, and social economics as well. <clears throat> and I want to highlight another issue that doesn't get discussed a lot in the environmental disparities research. Um, this is also by Mercedes Bravo, which is a, a, an issue of exposure measurement error that gets carried through our biostatistical models that often doesn't get accounted for. So this is Sao Paulo in Brazil. This is the Sao Paulo metro area. The blue area is the city. They call it the dog. You can see why. I think that's so cute. Um, these little dots are air pollution monitors. Now, in this map, um, what we've done is we've color-coded um, each district by a Brazilian-defined measure of socioeconomic status. Brazilian city is different from the U.S. city in that the richest populations live in the center of the city. So this dark blue is, if you've been to St. Paul, this dark blue, those are the rich communities, and then poor people live on the outskirts. Now you can see the air pollution monitors <coughs> are in the center of the city. Now that means that when I estimate air pollution for the city of St. Paulo or the metro area of St. Paulo, whatever method I use, whether I use nearest monitor or some kind of spatial interpolation, I have better exposure certainty for the richer populations than I do the poorer populations. And that is very rarely carried through to the end of the, the beta estimate, the estimate of air pollution and health. I'm not saying that's why they put the air pollution monitors there. I'm saying that's an artifact of the monitoring design. And then you can see the opposite happening. And then if we looked at this in um, US studies, you can see other differences as, as, you, as you make choices about like what, 
what, what measurement method you pick, like what buffer you design you pick, your, your population changes, your um, educational attainment can change for what population you have moving that, that lives near or far from that monitor. Now, do these issues really matter? Well, they do if you're studying that issue. And since we're really trying to start to study that issue of whether or not socioeconomic matters, um, I think we need to start taking these methodological concerns into account. And that's something that's rarely discussed and I think should be. <clears throat> so I want to move beyond the general population into looking at subpopulations, environmental justice, other issues, looking beyond effect modification to other issues as well. I'm so sorry for my throat. I couldn't cancel though, I had to come. <clears throat> All right, and the last theme is that, um, like Hopkins is famous for doing a good job at this, but I'm also trying to move beyond the U.S. Western Bay studies, which for air pollution is still where we have most of our information. So I just want to give you a few examples of some of the work we're doing. Some of these aren't air pollution examples, but looking at environment more broadly. Um, this is some work from Kate Burroughs, who's one of my doctoral students. This is work in Indonesia where we're looking at um, people who migrate from Indonesia, uh, or within Indonesia, migrate out of their community due to landslides or other regions, and where uh, the long-term plan is to see what kind of mental health outcomes they have based on that migration. Does it differ for people who migrate for environmental reasons or other reasons? So these are some of her preliminary results. <coughs> This um, figure represents their province, and you can see green are people who move from <coughs> environmental moves, so that's like a landslide or flood, and black are people who move for other reasons. And so you can see, looking at the fraction of, of <coughs> environmental moves and non-environmental moves, most people stayed within a province, for example. Um, here you can see that there were a lot more rule to rule moves for the non-environmental moves, and a lot more urban to urban moves for the environmental moves and, and so on. So these are some of the type of information that we're starting to gather and uh, getting ready to do the second phase of the kind of a larger pilot study. The first pilot study has been done. So Kate's getting ready to do a pilot study. And this will be part of her doctoral dissertation. Whoops, so forgive that little preliminary down there. Um, <laughs> it's coming, it's a teaser. Um, another um, aspect of air quality that we're interested in is adaptation and people's perceptions to adaptation. So um, I'm not going to go through the details, but just to highlight some of the work we're doing, this is Steve Whitaker, who's my postdoc, and he's doing work in the Caribbean looking at people's attitudes towards climate change adaptation in the Caribbean and St. Kitts. So he's working with community leaders, businesses, and the local public, and he's also doing spirometry measurements. Um, looking at what people's attitudes are towards climate change adaptation. <coughs> um, this is work from Lan Jin, who was my former student, um, looking at air pollution in China, and she's looking at, or did look at, risk of congenital heart defects in relation to exposures to mothers during pregnancy in Lanzhou using a birth cohort. And this was really powerful for the, um, the community leaders in, in Lanzhou because you start talking about um, risk of the elderly for cardiovascular hospital missions, that's one thing, but when you start talking about risk of congenital heart defects, um, it gets their attention more. I guess some human health outcomes have a different pull for policymakers than others. Um, and as we know, this, there's some very high air pollution levels in China. <clears throat> Amruta Sarma is a doctoral student, my senior doctoral student. She's doing some fantastic work on heat, air pollution in India. This is one of her preliminary figures. This is showing daily maximum temperature and risk of mortality in India, where you can see a very high risk of mortality happening with temperature. Um, and so part of why her work is important is due to the high levels of air pollution that happen in India simultaneously with the very high levels of heat, where during part of her study period, the pavement literally melted, which I thought was a joke when she told me it was not. She sent photographic evidence. Um, but, you know, this is a place where one might intuitively think they're not susceptible to heat waves, but they actually are, and their response to heat waves is quite different from people in the United States. It's important today and also under a changing climate. 
Just one last example. This is Sulky Ho, who's also the postdoc who did the work with Green Space. She's looking at heat and mortality in Korea, in Korea. So, you know, we're trying to, or I'm interested in trying to expand my work to look at other parts of the world because for, for a multitude of reasons. One, that's where a lot of our problems were, uh, are. And secondly, um, people are different in different parts of the world and we respond differently in different parts of the world. So, you know, actually understanding heat in India is informative for other parts of the world as well who may have those types of conditions in the future under a change in climate. So it's all useful scientific information. Um, so those are my four themes. Um, but I just want to talk a little bit to conclude that <clears throat> I started talking about, we started with this kind of single pollutant framework um, and we're moving to a multi-pollutant framework and to bar a term from the um, atmospheric engineering community. We're moving towards a one atmosphere approach. I know that Hopkins has a one university approach. I heard someone mention today. But it's the same type of idea. So one atmosphere, you know, you think about you're exposed to all these different types of things at once. I don't think that means we get rid of single pollutant science. Um, here's where maybe I differ a little bit from some of my colleagues because the first thing um, people are going to ask if, if we come up with and say it's, it's industry X has higher you know, harmful pollutants than industry Y, people are gonna say, okay, well, what is it in that that makes it so harmful? So I really think that we need both and that both make a valuable contribution. Um, but it's not just air pollution, it's not just atmosphere. We have nutrition and diet, water quality, occupational exposures, all these exposures before we are, were born. Some of these other things I've mentioned, like climate change, greenness, susceptibility, and so on. So I think we eventually need to start moving, as difficult as it is, to start thinking about moving towards a one, atmosphere, one environment approach as well. Um, and finally, I want to thank my team members and my funding sponsors, and thank all of you for listening, and again, apologize for my, my cough and my voice, but thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. I mean, there's plenty of time for some questions, so if people have questions, I can bring the mic. I actually had one question I'll start it off with. But so, so air pollution, um, the pollution comes in through the lung, so I can understand how the lung can be affected, you know, but you're, you're looking at heart, so that's a secondary effect. Something must come through the blood or through the nervous system. And then what about, you don't mention, or lot, most of the studies don't mention other organs. So if something's coming in the blood affecting the heart, can it affect the kidney, the liver, you know, other organs? So are there other health effects beside the cardiorespiratory system? Yeah, so there are a variety of health outcomes that have been looked at. Um, and as an epidemiologist, you know, my work cannot determine causal mechanisms. So that's really where we look to, to other people, to people who work with animal models and to physiologists to really look at those types of questions. Um, so for our initial work, we look to physicians to help us identify the ICD codes that we should be looking at and so on. Um, but yes, it can affect a lot of different uh, types of causes. It affects increased risk of cancer, lung cancer, um, variety of different types of cancer and so on. So, I mean, the short answer is, is yes, but, you know, I just want to be honest that that's not, that's not the, the type of work that um, my work can contribute to, other than perhaps identifying a place to look, um, but that's really to get that really type of causal information we need to uh, collaborate with other disciplines and look to them for some guidance. Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, so, right, so in the western U.S., most of our time is spent indoors. It's not true everywhere in the world. Um, most of our major sources originate outdoors, and almost all of our regulated sources are outdoors. So I think both are important, and everyone has their contribution to make. I've chosen to look at outdoor sources. EPA right now is not regulating a lot of indoor 
sources. Um, so that's kind of where my contribution is. And they are related, your indoor exposure is related to your outdoor exposure. The fact that we find such enormous health outcomes, um, associations between outdoor measurements, if that's what we choose to use, and health outcomes just show how large the health, the health impact is. Um, now, I don't mean to say there aren't some major indoor sources of air pollution in the Western environment, like VOCs and so on, because there definitely are. Um, that's not been my focus. And to be honest, the indoor air pollution environment communities and the outdoor air pollution environment communities have not collaborated as much as we should. And I think that's something that could, um, maybe in a few years, that's, a, that's something I, I could hopefully work on. Um, Yeah, I was intrigued by your smoke wave data and also with the recent um, um, uh, wildfires, for example, in, in California, where you will have, because you showed the Midwest, which is not as, has not as dense populations maybe as, for example, now San Francisco, LA, that are cities that have, although they're very urban, are now experiencing smoke from wildfires. So you'll have new mixtures where air pollution from traffic is mixing with smoke. I was wondering if you have any clue on that. And also, what is the wave, like how long is the wave? Does the, does the length of the smoke wave also influence? I mean, I would assume so. Yeah, so the first part of your question was about the mixing of wildfire smoke with other sources. And that's something that we did not look at, but is critically important. So we, for our study, isolated wildfire smoke. So we did not look at wildfire smoke in relation to other sources, but I think that's very much something that's worth looking at. And the second one is we did not look at wildfire smoke waves that lasted like three months or something like that, um, but they can. You know, um, another thing is that we looked at wildfires. We also didn't look at prescribed burns, which is something else that we could look at. And um, it's very interesting too, talking to the forestry community, because a lot of them think that we need more, more prescribed burn fires. But there's a perception in the public that, you know, burning trees is bad. I mean, it seems that way, you know. <laughs> Don't burn, you know. But it's, it's really not for the forest, because we have a for, we have, we have built cities in places their forests maybe should have been, and our cities are up against the forest. This is how they explain it to me. I'm going out of my depth, but, you know, so we have this kind of natural management phenomenon happening. And so um, I think estimating the public health impacts of prescribed burns is another issue that I think should be put into, into the mix you know, in addition to the issue of long-term burns. I think Marsha. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. That was great. So there's something that's always been confusing to me, and I'd like to get your take on it. As you nicely pointed out, there's a variation in the uh, substances that are present in various locations in the air and maybe interacting with PM 2.5. But interestingly, you show the same health effects in all these different areas. So how do you think we can break that down and understand which components are actually driving the health effects? Since there clearly is variation from location to location, but you still see similar health effects. Yeah, well, I, I, I thought about that a lot. I have a slide that I, I made for my class when I first started teaching um, that I made very naively that was like, you know, what harms us for PM 2.5? And I listed out the various different hypotheses at the time, like metal, size, you know, all these different things. Um, and I remember when I made that slide thinking, this is so great, because in five years I'll be able to make a slide with like lines to it, crossing things off the list. <clears throat> and I think that's so stupid, because clearly we're just adding things to the list, <laughs> like, because the answer is not a silver bullet. It's probably many of those things matter, and probably some matter for some health outcomes, and others matter for others, and that makes perfect sense. And some matter for short-term exposure, and some matter for long-term exposure, and that makes perfect sense, and as you mentioned, in your question, we see health effects everywhere. Even if we see some variation in the health effects, we see an overall effects everywhere. So it's become very difficult. Um, and the research it, for a while advanced very, and actually the Hopkins Particulate Matter Center did a lot of this work, advanced very rapidly showing um, 
you know, different ways of dimensionality reduction and different ways of looking at complex mixtures and so on, but, you know, never found, like, this is the source that's the most harmful for you. Um, past a point, I think, from a regulator, if all of it's bad for you and we're looking at degrees of bad, one strategy might just be just treat it, <laughs> treat it all as bad, but there still is some indication that some particles are more harmful than others. And, and I will say that my personal review of the literature is that the most consistent evidence is for traffic. The traffic combustion particles appear to be more harmful than other particles. Um, so I, I would unfortunately say it's still an unanswered question. Um, well, that's why I personally believe both single pollutant studies and one atmosphere or, or multi-pollutant studies are both, are all important. Um, and I think that, you know, for, for my group, I, I'm a big believer in that we never do just data mining or data crunching, that you have to understand the underlying systems that we're dealing with. It's never just a matter of being able to do the math. And you and I have had conversations about that. How I, I think you have to really understand the underlying systems. Um, that said, you know, there's there's kind of a, a limit to which complexity you can deal with. I also think there's probably different ways of regulating. Um, like, do we have to regulate a pollutant, or could you tell a city, you know, our goal is to decrease mortality by X percent, and do you want to do it through regulating pollutant X, or pollutant X and Y, or pollutant X, Y, and Z, or is our goal you need to produce each of these pollutants to this level. I don't know, that's a kind of a far out concept compared to how things are done now. But right now, we don't have the scientific information to even be able to think about what would be most effective. But as you mentioned, it is um, not effective for us to right now regulate everything as if it was equally Im impactful for health when we suspect that it's not. Um, Part of the other issue is that we continue to find other health outcomes that are more harmful. So for example, when we looked at the costs and benefits of the Clean Air Act, those were initially estimated with no mortality impact for ozone. Now we have strong evidence that ozone is impacting mortality. And those standards were initially set, and now are updated, um, with, with mortality, initially set without mortality being an impact. Now the evidence for air pollution and birth outcomes is quite strong, depending on the air pollutant, where Several years ago, it was maybe more suggestive. So as we move along, we're finding more and more health evidence and so on. And so we kind of have this constant update of many other aspects of, of science as well. Um, you know, currently the standards are set without, in theory, set without regard to cost. They're just set at a level to protect human health with an adequate margin for sensitive subpopulations. And then cost plays a role in how and when the state needs to implement that regulation and come into compliance. Um, so the, the regs are, they say that cost, I know the law says. I said in theory, the I said in theory. Yeah. Well, in setting, setting the standard in theory, so that you know, the, the level should be X. But the, the, the regs are also set at a level safe for human health where we're not finding threshold levels. So what does that mean as well? The levels were also designed assuming that their threshold levels would maybe be identified, so. I mean, I agree with your underlying question, but that's why I think that the single pollutant science is, the single pollutant science is still needed. I guess part of what does it mean for single pollutant science is that if you really think that th there may be some pathways through which there are not major interactions with other pollutants or other factors, and there may be others where those are really important and we need to tease those out and be able to describe them. 
do single pollutant studies like the way we've done them, where we ignore all the other pollutants because they're all being coming out of the same pipes, the same transportation pipes, the same energy. Well, they were, pipes. they were never ignored. They were considered as confounders and incorporated. Should we get, I mean, I, in a lot of the studies, they actually show up, and we have hundreds of right-hand side variables with all these other chemicals that are coming out. No, but I don't argue. I don't. I don't think you. I'm not a big fan of kitchen sink where you throw in everything. Right, but um, we can talk, have a longer conversation later. But but um, but I th but this is why I think understanding the underlying system is important. So you know which variables do I need and which one do I not need. And there's also ways to look at space and time potential confounders without identifying what they specifically are. So there's some nice models for that as well. Yeah, um, so that kind of natural experiment where, yeah, so there was a, some really great studies that I was not involved in at the Beijing Olympics where air pollution got so much better and health responses got so much better and then they went back, but, <laughs> you know. But yeah, I, I agree with you. Michelle, great talk. And kind of in, in the context of this, this regulatory environment which focuses on PM itself and its chemical constituents, what do you think about the biotic exposures that might be microbial, they could be microbial derivatives like endotoxin, allergens, that aren't necessarily targeted by regulation, but may be really important to rural urban disparities or may be important in some of these disaster-related effects that we can sometimes see? How do you think about that? Um, you mean, do I think they should be regulated? No, just what do you think about those as part of a multi-pollutant approach? I'd love to study them as part of our mixture, you know, but there are a lot of things that we don't have enough information on to incorporate, and my personal knowledge is I don't know enough data, so I would love to collaborate with someone who had some data or knew how to get some data to look at that, especially in relation to the, the rural environment where those exposures could be really important and impactful and meaningful. Uh, I was wondering what, uh, if there was something in particular that motivated your interest for the differences in men and women. Um, and like you said, I mean, we need to look into it more. Uh, if who ideally would be your collaborators or the, the areas of expertise that you would draw on to elucidate some, maybe more mechanistically, uh, what's, what's going on for those differences? Um, my motivation started just because um, I'd seen for many health outcomes and reading some work about <coughs> You know how there were sur different surgical tools for men and women, how a lot of surgical tools were designed for men, but women had different respiratory symptoms. And I read an article and I thought, oh, well, this makes a lot of sense. Men and women could have different health responses. Um, so I applied for like a little pilot grant. And then I would say the next motivation, I'm just going to be perfectly honest here, was stubbornness. Because the response was not just, we don't going to fund you, is that there's, you know, this is not worth looking at. Um, and I didn't like that. And then, <laughs> and then I applied again, and I got the same response. These are like, this is for fifty thousand dollars, is what I asked for, to be honest. Um, and I got the same response again, and I wrote it pretty well too. But there was, it was, this is not worth looking at. Um, so then I just did it, but I had to wait till I could fund it myself, which, which just is just time and money, and it wasn't that much time or money, but. Um, but in terms of looking at it, and I haven't done much follow-up work on it since, although I have done some systematic reviews looking at effect modification for men and women, um, and I will get to the second part of your question, but in the, this, this, the systematic reviews looking at how 
effect modification for men and women, which EPA did fund, it's very difficult to look at because the vast, vast majority of those studies were not like mine. They're studies where they kind of looked at men and women on the side. They're like, they're doing a study looking at this hypothesis, and by the way, we're gonna look at if it's different between men and women. And they very often find a difference, sometimes, sometimes not, it's kind of suggestive, but it's difficult to make a synthesis of scientific evidence when it's everybody's secondary question. So that's part of our conclusion. Um, but in terms of collaboration or her, whoever could look at it, I mean, um, this relates to your question in terms of like the physiology of why you know, we have some different health outcomes where differences were noticed between men and women and some health outcomes where they were not. And that's not my area of expertise. Like I'm not a physiologist, I'm not a physician, I don't have an MD. And someone with that type of expertise or some knowledge of the human body beyond my knowledge would be able to look at that and maybe say this, this is some hypotheses for why this makes sense for men versus women, and then be able to follow up on in that way. Bill. Michelle, thanks. Thank you very much for your talk. Very, very interesting. I'd like to get back to the regulatory components. Uh, uh, the regulatory component, just, just a bit. We've seen many images over the last several years, particularly in the West, of these incredible fires. and and billowing smoke that, that covers square miles, many square miles. And it, it, it uh, <clears throat> sort of begs the issue in some folks' minds about whether we're spinning our wheels worried about a little bit of uh, emissions from uh, what many think is now under control, automobile uh, emissions and so forth, in the face of these massive kinds of pollutant uh, episodes that are occurring. You alluded lightly to the fact that there might be a difference in the, in the, the, the uh, impact, physiologic impact of forest fire smoke relative to automobile and other vehicular emissions. Uh, is, there, is there a reason, uh, I mean, is there a basis for that that we might point to to make the point that we still need to regulate those? And uh, it's not being driven by in some areas of the country by this massive uh, smoke um, produced by burning. That we still need to regulate the other, the other sources? Or to still need to regulate forest fires? No, we can't regulate Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's enormous evidence. When we still have over 100 million people in the US that live in areas exceeding the health-based standards for ozone. Um, and we have studies showing clear health responses for health outcomes like mortality at levels below the, the EPA standard for ozone. Um, and there's, there's other studies by other, other researchers for particulate matter as well. Um, and then that's for mortality. And then we have other health outcomes as well. And then if someone wants to look at the economic cost of that, I mean, I had an economist, economist tell me that the Clean Air Act was the most cost-effective law in United States history. That's largely from the avoided mortality from particulate matter. Um, I, think, I think part of this is that people look at some of these higher pollution levels in other places, and it's kind of it's a day-to-day -day exposure, and people may not, may not think of it. But I mean, the, the impacts are still huge. And I think this is also part of the, uh, I mean, you didn't mention climate change in your question, but I think this is also part of the lack of some public health concern, or some general public concern over climate change, is the lack of the public health discussion in the overall discussion about climate change. I think when we talk about sea level rise in a foreign country, um, that may seem very abstract and not uh, have a, a lot of relevancy to people, but when you start talking about you know, increased asthma for children in you know, general America suburbia, that people may become more interested, it may hit closer to home. Um, and that is what we're talking about. Um, so I think it's, it's kind of become part of the background. And they look, you know, they may see pictures of the London Fog in 1952 and say, well, we don't have that anymore. Um, but actually, you know, we, we still have very high levels of air pollution and ozone. And then, but then we also have a lot of money being uh, pumped into discussion saying it would, you know, kill the economy to do anything. So it's very difficult to, for I think for the general public to really know um, what's going on. And I think scientific denialism is at a maybe all-time high, you know, so I think those are very difficult um, issues, issues for, for all of us, but. 
I, I think we should probably um, wrap it up. Um, thank you very much, Michelle, for a fascinating talk and discussion. Yeah.